Welcome, everybody. This is the Research Expertise Cluster 2 on Disease Medicine, Pharmaceuticals, and Biomedical Engineering. So good morning, Manila, and um, good evening, America. We have a distinguished batch of speakers for um, today. Uh, Dr. Franco Tevez and Dr. Fiorillo Galivo will be talking on pharmaceuticals, you know, the cutting edge. Dr. Tevez will talk about the biosynthesis of penicillin in a new platform. And Dr. Galivo will talk about human gallbladder cells uh, induced to produce insulin. We also have Dr. Del Mundo who will talk about you know, the structural differences in DNA that may lead, that may be linked to cancer and also uh, possibly therapeutics. Uh, we will not forget the social sciences. We have Dr. Rehensha, who will uh, talk on a topic very close to our hearts, social media, the effect or of anxiety and depression on the use of social media. That's, so these are all interesting topics. And of course, we will not forget our global problem, which is climate change. So Dr. Renzo Ginto will talk about that. So <clears throat> let me just introduce our first speaker, Dr. Franco Tevez. He is Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs at MSU. He's also Ambassador for the Academe um, of the DOST. He's the leader for the Philippine Air Force Air Education. He finished his Bachelor of Science in Medical Technology at Siliman and a Master of Science at the uh, UP Los Banos. He did his PhD in Microbiology. He, is also, he was the former chair of the Department of Biological Sciences at MSU and former president of the Philippine Society for Microbiology, uh, the Mindanao chapter. So Dr. Tevis will be talking about uh, revisiting the roles of homocytrate in pathway distress and homoaconitase in the regulation of the alpha amino adipate pathway in penicillium so let me stop my share and Dr. Tevis, please. Uh, good, <clears throat> good morning, colleagues in the Philippines, and uh, good evening to those who are in the United States. Let me first share screen my presentation. Uh, this paper is up in working on the beta lactam producing filamentous fungi. The focus is on the regulation of the alpha amino adipate biosynthetic pathway, vital for the synthesis of both lysine and penicillin in penicillium chrysogenum. The main objective of this paper is to present two proposed systems or mechanisms in the regulation of the alpha amino adipate pathway in penicillium chrysogenum from our previous studies and attempt to see any convergence. It all started when I received a grant from the Spanish government to do my research at the Universidad de Leon in the historical city of Leon in the north of Spain. The synthesis of lysine in, in penicillium chrysogenum occurs in two parts. Part one begins with the formation of homocytrate by the condensation of alpha ketoglutarate and acetyl coenzyme A, catalyzed by the first enzyme of the pathway, homocytrate synthase. The homo to homoisocytrate, to alpha ketoadipate, and then to alpha aminoadipate catalyzed by homoaconitase, 
homoisocitrate dehydrogenase and alpha amino adipate amino transferase. The alpha amino adipate is the branch point where the lines see another simplified version of the pathway shows that three to four genes are apparently upregulated by an accumulation of uh, homocytrate. This also shows the mutant homoaconitase gene or the least three gene, which I worked on, leading to the conceptualization of one model of gene regulation, which I will describe later. The numbering of the lysine genes indicate the order by which such genes were cloned from penicillium chrysogenum and characterized by our team. I was third in the line. <laughs> it's due to the gap in the search for a gene regulatory mechanism in the alpha amino adipate pathway in penicillium chrysogenum. My report in 2001 was the first description of a putative gene regulatory mechanism of the alpha amino adipate pathway. An alternative model came out in 2009 with studies on the possible role of the intermediate homocytrate in the upregulation of at least four genes in the pathway through a pathway distress signal. Mutants and wild type strains are essential in studying the issues five penicillium chrysogenum strains used in our study. The L2 mutant strain, uh, before I joined the team, was only used as a reference strain for lysine oxotropy. When I joined in, I worked on the L2 mutation in the L2 mutant for my research and I was able to identify the mutated gene causing lysine oxotrophy, paving the way to describing for the first time its regulatory function. We did classical screening of a penicillium chrysogenum uh, genomic DNA library and found one clone referred to as PAMPL 2.1 that complemented the L2 mutation restoring lysine prototrophy. The new strain developed, we call L2 plus C, is able to grow on minimal medium without lysine. The rest of the methods are standard methods in molecular genetics. The homo aconitase gene is unique. It's a member of the aconitase family of proteins. As can be shown in this uh, figure, it has three highly conserved cysteine residues, which act as ligands in the formation of an iron sulfur cluster. A cubane structure sensitive to that are involved in electron transfer. The iron sulfur cluster of homo aconitase interacts directly with its substrate. Uh, here is another presentation of um, a um, sequence alignment with other known uh, aconitases, also showing the mutations that we uh, identified in the L2 mutant. There are a functional uh, cubane structure, okay, granting that all the um, elements are present, then you have a cubane structure there, which is important for the catalytic function of homo aconitase. Uh, any factor that would disrupt it will uh, cause a change in the function of the gene. How do the four lines in genes cloned and described by our research team interact with each other? An experiment was set up which aimed to measure relative gene transcription levels in the mutant strain, L2 strain, compared to the wild type 
or defunct. As can be seen, the levels of uh, lysine 1, lysine 2, 3, and 7 in the L2 mutant uh, are upregulated in the L2 mutation. How does this mutation cause the upregulation? This leads us to examine the characteristics of the related aconitases and propose a similar mechanism. Uh, this is what is referred to as an aconitase type catalytic mechanism. And we also made a name for this uh, used by other researchers as well, uh, the, moonlight, the moonlighting switch mechanism. Okay, now this was the first model that um, we have proposed. And in here, um, the homo aconitase can shift from catalytic to regulatory. And as a regulatory protein, it is basically like other aconitases, uh, an mRNA binding protein. Now we recall that the L2 mutant accumulates homocytrate since the mutant homo aconitase can no longer catalyze the transformation. Uh, the complete blocking of the lysine biosynthesis. Now, we ask what if we disrupt the least one gene, that's the first gene in the pathway, okay, homocytrate synthase, to prevent homocytrate accumulation in the L2 mutant. And so we did a uh, double recombination experiment uh, shown in the figure here to disrupt the least one gene leading to the formation of a double mutant, one which has a mutated homo aconitase and a mutated homocytrate synthase. Comparing the size of the list one chain in the L2 and the disrupted list one chain in the double mutant by agarose gel electrophoresis and later on by DNA sequencing confirms success of the experiment. The mutation also has an effect on the phenotype of the penicillium chrysogenum, as can be seen here. With low lysine concentration, penicillium chrysogenum double mutant grows very slowly compared to the L2 mutant. But with a higher concentration of lysine, both can grow with conf confluent growth. Now, uh, removing the homocytrate from the L2 mutant we checked its effect on the expression of the four lysine genes, namely LIS1, LIS2, LIS3, and LIS7. And our observation is that when we eliminate the homocytrate in the L2 mutant, this relieves pathway distress and the expression levels of the four genes in the pathway return to basal levels. The question is then, what is the possible mechanism involved? So it is either the first one, when we have uh, the, the switching of function of homo aconitase from catalytic to regulatory, or a mechanism which is homocytrate induced upregulation of at least four genes in the pathway. But this would require a homocytrate receptor that is activated when there is an accumulation of homocytrate in the cell. And that is the one that is still being studied at, as of the moment. We're still trying to figure out and to identify a homocytrate receptor. And uh, which mechanism is at play? It could be the first one or this one or a combination of both. So that is still going to be resolved. And in conclusion, we report for the first time a gene regulation mechanism in penicillium chrysogenum, the alpha amino adipate biosynthetic pathway, and the uh, first reported putative regulatory um, mechanism. And that the mutation in the L2 strain either causes the transform, uh, transformation of homo aconitase protein from catalytic to RNA binding, 
uh, directly inducing trans transcriptional upregulation of at least four genes in the pathway, or that the accumulation of homocytrate causes a distress in the pathway and activating a um, receptor that would then upregulate the four genes in the pathway. There is a possibility of inter the two men that needs to be elucidated. This study opens the way for rational manipulation of the alpha amino adipate biosynthetic pathway uh, in industrial strains of uh, penicillin chrysogen for driving the flux of um, intermediates from the lysine branch to the penicillin branch. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Tevez. That was very interesting. <clears throat> uh, we will reserve our questions for after the talk of the next speaker. Our um, next speaker is Dr. Amy Marie Del Mundo. Uh, Dr. Del Mundo is from the University of Texas at Austin, and she's with the Division of Pharmacology and Toxicology. She is a Bachelor of Science a degree holder in chemistry, cum laude. She had her Doctorate of Philosophy in Chemistry at the University at Buffalo, the State University in New York. And uh, she did her postgraduate training also at the University of Texas at Austin. You see, she has many publications, and that's what I highlighted here. She will talk to us about the new twists and turns in the DNA. Um, we know the DNA is a double helix, but she'll talk more of the different kinds of structures, and it's linked to cancer and therapeutics. So Dr. Marie Del Mundo. Thank you, Mom Yasmin. I'm about to share my screen. Can you all see? Okay, so um, hello everyone. Um, okay. Oops. Let me just. Start my video, sorry. <laughs> and then, hi. Okay, hello everyone, good morning. Uh, Filipinas, and then good evening for us here in the US. First of all, I would like to uh, thank the 41st, uh, 41st APAMS organizing committee and of course, um, PASE for providing this platform to share and exchange expertise in different uh, fields. So it's a great privilege to be here. So today I would like to be able to share to you uh, a short story about non-BDNA structures, what they are, how they form, um, what roles they play and why, and most importantly, why we want to care about them. We uh, would also want to know how to modulate these non-BDNA structures and how to go about doing that. So uh, I will share uh, our most recent publications on the assays that we have developed to do that, as well as uh, some of the preliminary uh, results. So uh, everyone is familiar with the canonical right-handed double helical structure, which uh, Watson Crick and Rosalind Franklin described in the 1950s. However, since then, there had been at least a dozen of, alternat of alternative or what we will call non-BDNA structures. So you have this cross-looking cruciform, uh, three-stranded uh, HDNA or triplex. We also had a four-stranded DNA, or G4 DNA, or even a left-handed Z DNA. So what's amazing with these structures 
is that what we're learning is that not only are they physically different, but they also require different things to form and that they perform different functions in the cell. So let's take, for example, uh, HDNA. So HDNA is gonna be the focus of my talk. So it's also known as intramolecular triplex. So it's three strands instead of two. And uh, what it requires to be able to form is uh, a mirror repeats shown here. So if you have this, I hope you can see me. So you have the mirror repeat here when the DNA opens, like one of this strand can fold over and then you will have this three DNA structures, three stranded DNA structure. So it occurs one in 50,000 base pairs. So you could imagine it's, it's pretty common in a way. And then it's stabilized by negative supercoiling. Supercoiling is represented here, which usually happens every time you open your double helical structure. Um, it's also stabilized by Hoogstein hydrogen bonding, which is an alternative um, uh, H bonding interaction uh, separate from what you would uh, see in a Watson Crick complementary base. There, it's also stabilized by some divalent cations such, a, such as magnesium. So these non BDNA structures are usually found in um, biologically active regions in the cell, meaning they perform um, important biological processes. And what, what we're knowing now is that they can be involved in uh, regulation of transcription, replication, even repair, such as homologous recombination. But what our lab has shown, which we pioneered in and has been investigating on, is that it is also a source of genetic instability. So let's again go back to our example, the HDNA, the intramolecular triplex. So they are usually found in axons and promoters, such as the simic gene. So the simic gene, as we know, is upregulated in diseases such as Burkitt's lymphoma and leukemia. And uh, what we did is that we took an HDNA forming sequence from the simic gene and then put it into a mutation reporter plasmid, which is then transfected into mammalian cells. And what we found is that those uh, HDNA forming sequences are 20% more mutagenic. So we are the lab which first showed that they are mutagenic in mammalian cells and human cells. We also have a, a system or an animal model containing this H as well as ZDNA forming sequences uh, in which the mice have them incorporated in their uh, genome. And so uh, what we saw is that the genetic instability was detected in up to 20% of the progeny or F1 mice. Um, so this is uh, just giving you on the tip of the iceberg on how the DNA itself can be a source of genetic instability. And to further drive that point home, we also look at um, the Cosmic database, which is a database of um, cancer genomes, uh, in particular, translocation-related cancers. And so we looked at 20,000 sequences of human genomes, again, you know, relating to cancer. And uh, when we talk about translocation, it's a, uh, it's what happens when a part of your chromosome detaches in one part and then reattaches to another. So here, the point here where it's point and reattach is what you call a break point. And so if we consider that uh, break point as zero, uh, we also look at the sequences before that break point or after that break point. And what we saw is that, um, those cancer genomes are highly enriched in HDNA forming sequences compared to a control sequence. So this is another layer that uh, this non-BDNA structures has pathophysiological relevance in the etiology of cancer. And so uh, we also look at G4DNA, HDNA and ZDNA in that um, databases and all of them are highly enriched around the translocation breakpoint. And so uh, it drives home that they are uh, possibly 
involved in the etiology of cancer. On the other hand, hairpins and cruciforms are usually implicated in neurodegenerative diseases, such as fragile X syndrome, Huntington's, myotonic dystrophy, Friedrichs, et cetera. So as much as like 30 uh, triplet repeat diseases are implicated uh, by hairpin and cruciform. So really we, it is very, this is a, a budding field and we really have to be interested and uh, further research are needed in studying these non-BDNA structures. So now that we have a great deal of evidence implicating those, the structures being a source of genetic instability and therefore diseases, can we use that to our advantage? Can we actually um, use something to modulate that structure? So right now, what we have is that, you know, the stability of the structure, you have genetic instability. What if we can modulate that structure using small molecules? So we will call them ligands and possibly try to, uh, either stabilize or destabilize or modulate these non-BDNA structures. So uh, we have this current paradigm where um, if you have um, structure destabilizing ligand, it will reduce the genetic instability and therefore you might either uh, prevent the disease or at a leak, uh, be a therapeutic approach. On the other hand, there's also use for using a stabilizer, uh, the non-BDNA structure stabilizing ligand, because if you can have that ligand specifically targeting cancer cells, so you will push more genetic instability in those cancer cells, leading to more cell death of the cancer cells. So both, either way, we will have some use for small molecules that can stabilize or destabilize this non-BDNA structures. So how do we go about that? So the first thing that we needed to do is to have a substrate. So we wanted to have a substrate that's biologically relevant. And so uh, the chromosomal breakpoint hotspot sequence that I have been telling about, this is it. So you can see the mirror symmetry. And so in cells, we expect this to be forming this structure. So you can see the third strand here. This is the Hoogstein hydrogen bonding. But we wanted something that's um, easier, easier to handle. And that's where I came in because I designed an intermolecular model of this uh, triplex that's based from the chromosomal breakpoint hotspot. So again, you can see the Hoogstein hydrogen bonding here. And this is the third strand. So a um, couple of my uh, previous publications has been on structural characterization. And so to be able to say that, hey, this is forming a triplex and you have um, it's intermolecularly folding. I use a couple of biophysical experiments to prove that. So by gel mobility assay, uh, it's running really fast and therefore it's uh, folding intermolecularly. I also use CD spectroscopy, or uh, CD stands for circular dichroism. And what it helps is that uh, it provides us with um, signatures uh, and the structure formation. And I saw the presence of a triplex uh, signature. And then importantly, does this third strand really bind with a double strand? And I use uh, a fluorescent analog of adenine here. And uh, it's shown that as you open up, the fluorescence uh, actually lights up, meaning you have this uh, strand here actually interacting with the double strand. So now that we have a substrate, um, uh, we were, by the way, we were also able to characterize some of this using NMR and compu computational modeling. And so hopefully I can, this would run. So you can see the third strand here and it is interacting with the double strand and it's showing you there's a triplex three-stranded structure there. So 
The next thing is to um, formulate the assay. So the checklist for the assay is, it has to be able to detect both stabilizers and destabilizers. So the, the quest for destabilizers is, you know, we're the first one to, to forward that idea because for one, there's not much assay that looks for it. And so for this, the challenge is how do you incorporate looking for the stabilizer? So I wanted something that both can assay for stabilizers and destabilizers. And I did that by using um, a FRET or Forster Resonance Energy Transfer Technique. So I have a fluor fluorophore here, that's FAM, and then a quencher, that's BHQ. So when it's folding, so the FAM and the BH, BHQ are like on the same side. So the BHQ is quenching FAM. So if you have a stabilizing ligand here, for example, BEPI or coralline. So BEPI and coralline, they had been published as triplex ligands, but then they are not specific. And so we wanted something better than that. And so if you have something that can bind to the triplex and stabilize it, the FAM and the BHQ would be closer to each other. And therefore you have uh, less of the fan fluorescence. However, if you have a destabilizing ligand, which opens up your triplex, then you have more of the fan fluorescence. So it lights up. So as I said, there's really not a, no destabilizer that's known yet. And so for this, we used a strand that's complementary to the third strand. So we will call it that MCRA2. So that's the idea of the assay. And uh, to be able to, to show that it's not just changes in fluorescence, that's all, it's also happening with the substrate itself. So here is uh, a typical circular decreasing spectra or CD. So the first arrow here points to that signature of a triplex. So when it's just the R2 alone, it's the signature of the triplex is this negative negative value at around 220 nanometer. And so in the presence of coralline, which is a stabilizer, you can see it become stronger. However, with the presence of MCRA2 that destabilizes the triplex, it's all the way uh, negated. Also, this part here is a signature for interaction of coralline with that of the triplex. We call this the induced CD signal. And you can see that it is a very strong in the presence of triplex, <coughs> excuse me. Whereas in the presence of MCRA2, there's nothing there. So whatever we see as changes in the fluorescence, it's actually uh, correlating with what's happening in the triplex itself. And so the next thing that we did is to show a proof of principle that this assay works by assaying like around 330 compounds. We did this in collaboration with a core facility with the College of Pharmacy, the Targeted Therapeutic Drug Development uh, Project. And so our workflow looks like this, where we read first the compounds only because some of them would have inherent fluorescence. The second reading is without magnesium and the third reading is with magnesium. So we use this set of um, really high-tech uh, like instruments to do that. Um, so this is the preliminary result. And as I, I mentioned before, the beauty of this assay is that in one graph, you can see the stabilizers on top and then the stabilizers at the bottom. So you can see some of the hits, preliminary hits. And importantly, the, the statistic, statistical parameters that is usually measured for high throughput screen, the signal to noise and the Z factor, those numbers are fantastic for this uh, assay. So uh, both in looking for stabilizers and destabilizers. Uh, as a side note, it took us some time to get right buffer condition where you have a dynamic range where you can see really good signal in finding the stabilizers as well as the, as the destabilizers. But we did it and this is you know the preliminary result. So that's really looking good. 
So one of the hits for the stabilizer is doxorubicin. Of course, doxorubicin, as you some of you would know, is, is also unknown BDNA um, interacting ligand. However, what we would like to do this uh, do in here is to show that whatever the H threat is given, it can actually do, uh, it can actually give that effect in our uh, triplex substrate. So we wanted doxorubicin to show stabilizing interaction with that of the triplex. So first off, it's uh, KD or apparent binding constant is right around 126 nanomolar, which is pretty good. And then we also use two types of triplex. First, the R2, which is our chromosomal breakpoint hotspot based triplex. And then we also added another one, the GT triplex. So um, in our area, if you want to, to see stabilizing interaction, you would look for through that uh, in thermal melting assay. And that's when you melt the DNA. So it melts a certain way. And then if you have a stabilizing interactions, it will melt harder. And so that melting harder should would be shown by a shift in the thermal melting point. So you can see here, both the thermal melting point, uh, the GT triplex, as well as the R2 triplex has moved from a couple of degrees, right around four or five degrees to the right. And that means uh, doxorubicin is indeed um, show, uh, doing stabilizing interactions with the triplexes. So here are the preliminary results. Um, this is just showing you the chemical composition of the stabilizers and the destabilizers that we've seen from our preliminary assay. So some of them are have published bioactivities because the uh, our initial custom assembled compounds are known bioactive compounds, but some of them such as these two here are interesting because they don't have any known DNA interacting records yet. For the destabilizers, the oxalic platin is known also as a derivative of cisplatin. However, this eloxatin, it doesn't have any DNA interacts interacting records yet. So that will be interesting for us to pursue further. So obviously we will try to validate this results, scan for more, uh, uh, more libraries. We have like as much as 80,000 compounds and we wanted to scan them, uh, screen them and see which other novel uh, chemical compounds we can use as triplex modulating ligands. So with that, I would like to thank my, uh, my group. So this is Dr. Karen Vasquez, our PI. Uh, she's our lab mom and mentor. And I would also like to thank my collaborators from the College of Pharmacy core facility, Dr. Dalby and Dr. Cho. And then we have Dr. Kerwin, Dr. Foote, Dr. Ren, and Dr. Um, Fountain for the structural determinations. So you can see here, uh, we're pretty much a diverse lab and we had fun. Um, and so that's it for my presentation. For any questions, please dig in. Thank you so much, Dr. Del Mundo. That is so fascinating. Among the students here, do you have any questions? We will open the floor for questions on the first two speakers, Dr. Tevez, who spoke on the Aconites, and um, Dr. Del Mundo. Uh, Al, please. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Rogelio. That was an excellent presentation, Amy. Uh, definitely, I've been looking for such analytical cap capability for active compounds to help yeah. our plus lunas discoveries here coming from indigenous plants and activity and uh, bioactive compounds. So my question is, how applicable do you think your analytical, starting with the CD uh, mm -hmm. instrumentation, uh, in terms of assessing the effectiveness 
of some of the compounds that we have been isolating through the Toklas Tunas program in the Philippines under Philippine Council of Health, which is actually undertaken by former USEC uh, Ami Guevara. Uh, I've been trying to find a way to connect the two. Uh, uh, so the question is, how relevant do you think, uh, given that you're already doing the uh, screening with the active compounds in, in your lab uh, together with School of Pharmacy? So do you think that collaboration can prosper? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's a really great point. By the way, thank you, Dr. Serafika. Yes. <laughs> Dr. Al. Um, the, the thought of really using natural products, it really is close to my heart. I know we have a lot of, you know, very like, exotic compounds that we can try. And so one of the things that we usually say when we have this, uh, you know, grants that we write is that, you know, this assay, we can share it, you know, we can collaborate with other labs so that we can actually get, you know, sample libraries from them. Actually, one of the libraries that we have is actually from, you know, uh, compounds synthesized by chemists in UT. So definitely it's, it's open. It's open for that. Um, perhaps the use of the CD, it, it may require, you know, big instrumentation. However, the assay itself, you know, it's just fret based. As long as you have a fluorimeter that can have, uh, that can read the fan fluorescence, it will be, it will be easy. We just have to be able to, you know, put in the right controls so that you would have, you know, a robust, reading and uh, you know you, you you will be sure about the 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 quality of the readout or we can just have we can have because we have been doing this here in in college of pharmacy if, if there's a way to send those compounds that would be great too we can do that too okay thank you and since frack is right beside you in my screen Frank, do you think we can use PRISM in MSU IIP uh, uh, that I visited about two years back uh, together with Jinky Bornales, your vice chancellor? Is this something that you can undertake together with IME? I'm pairing you up already. <laughs> so, yes. Uh, yes, so. Dr. Al. Yes, yes. Very, very well. Well, it, it's, a, it's going to be a very possible, uh, you know, collaboration with uh, PRISM. It's now fully functional. Two years ago, <laughs> yeah, Prism, yeah. Uh, I that would be great. For the rest, rest of the audience is the Toklas Lunas laboratory that was put up in MSU IIT in Iligan that does a lot of the bioactive compound screening for plants coming out of Bukidnon and Davao. So clearly, that is a, uh, a good center to uh, capacitate uh, with more advanced capability that I need just presented. So with that, I'm very happy to uh, already uh, this worth my, <laughs> my my 30 minutes. Thank you, uh, yeah, Dr. Ronquillo, for, for allowing me to ask the question. Yes, we can talk more, Dr. Tevez. <laughs> there is one other person who, whose hand is raised, Zypher, please. Uh, hi, hello. Uh, good day to everyone. Uh, my question is for Dr. Tevez. Okay. Hi, Doc Tevez Cipher here. Morning. Nice, nice to see you again. Anyway, yeah. my question is, how applicable do you think is your result with a license production when it comes to uh, crops who uh, which are already uh, producing lysine and like uh, soybeans? Do you think uh, the method you you discovered for the lysine production for fungi is applicable to uh, crops and genetically modify them? Okay, uh, there is a basic difference in the uh, biosynthetic uh, pathway for lysine biosynthesis in plants. It's through the diaminopimelic acid pathway. So, on the fungi, which is through the alpha amino adipase pathway. So, uh, I, I don't think we can uh, merge the two because plants do have a separate biosynthesis biosynthetic pathway for lysine. 
Did I answer that question? <laughs> or that yes, 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 yes. No. no, no, no follow up question. I'm just, um, okay. I'm just, uh, uh, thinking about the application of which in the uh, genetically modified organisms, particularly for plants. Thank okay. you. Okay, welcome. Oh, those are very, very good questions. Thank you, Dr. Del Mundo, and thank you, Dr. Tevez, for addressing them. I'm sure the rest have questions. We will uh, print the emails of the speaker so that if you have further questions, you can email them. We will proceed with, uh, with our third speaker, uh, but you can still have questions after the last three speakers. Or mom, uh, perhaps they can also write in the chat, right? Yes, yes, yes. You're you can, shy, of course, you're welcome. Okay. Yeah, you're Thanks. welcome to use the chat. Please, please do. Our next speaker is Zypher Rehensha. He has a master's degree in food science. Um, he particularly mentioned his thesis, which is um, a physical, chemical, sensory, and functional properties of mangosteen peel juice drink. This is in line with the questions, you know, to Dr. Um, Del Mundo and uh, Dr. Tevez about our plants, you know, testing for plants. Uh, Zypher has a Bachelor of Science in Food Technology, again, uh, studying Makapuno. Um, he has several awards, the University President Medal Award, the College of Agriculture Medal, the OST Academic Excellence Award, and several other awards that he probably didn't write in his CV. Uh, he also has some publications. Um, he is the one who will speak on uh, the social and behavioral aspects of social media usage that um, may be helpful for all of us. So Dr. I'm sorry. Um, he, he told me that he's still, I, I'm not, to, uh, he advised me not to call him a doctor yet because he's not done with his PhD yet. So Cypher, please. Hello, uh, pleasant morning to all of you. Uh, I am Zypher Judji Rehensha from the uh, Department of Clinical Epidemiology, Univ uh, College of Medicine, University of the Philippines, Manila. And now I'm going to talk to you one of our researches on occupational health, particularly uh, the effect of anxiety and depression, disorders on the daily uh, media usage, um, daily social media usage among cargo seafarers. This is a cross-sectional cross study. Okay. Uh, I have no conflict of interest to declare. Okay. I'm sorry. Let me just go. Ah, sorry. Okay. Just go back. Okay. Cargo seafarers may experience uh, different mental health issues uh, because of their harsh environment, because of uh, they are always at sea due to prolonged isolations, being away from their family and friends. They are at risk for depression and anxiety. And as we all know, depression and anxiety are the two most common mental health disorders globally. Okay. Uh, it is estimated that there are about 1.6 million seafarers worldwide, in which 774,000 of whom were officers. In fact, Filipinos or the Philippines uh, account for a great deal of workforce uh, in seafaring businesses. And the Philippines belong to the, belongs to the five largest seafarer supplier countries, including China, Indonesia, the Russian Federation, and the Ukraine. Moreover, it is estimated as of July 2021, according to the uh, uh, hat suite, uh, that there are about 4.48 billion uh, active social media users worldwide, 
which account for about 57% of the entire global population. On the other hand, 99% uh, of these global active social media users access social media through their phones with an average amount of time per day spent using social media of 2 hours and 24 minutes. In the United States, uh, in a survey in 2018 by the Pew Research Center, um, ages 30 to 49 and 50 to 64 actively engage on social media, particularly on Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, LinkedIn, WhatsApp, Twitter, and Snapchat. Account, uh, Facebook has the highest number of proportion of uh, um, users uh, in the adult United States survey. Moreover, in the Philippines from data spring, uh, it is estimated that, that 76 million Filipinos are active in social media. So social media is really a powerful device in information dissemination. So it is estimated that 7 out of 10 Filipinos actively use social media every day with an average amount of 4 hours and 12 minutes per day. Therefore, our objective of our study assess the association between the depression and anxiety levels, occupational experiences of these cargo seafarers, and the socioeconomic factors, as well as the levels of social media usage among the cargo seafarers. So we determine the levels of depression and determine the social media usage and then analyze. Ethics approval was granted by an independent research ethics committee, and 146 international seafarers were recruited in this cross-sectional study. An English web-based self-administered questionnaire were disseminated to, to the participants through an online platform. So we assess the exposure. So in here, the anxiety and the depression were the main exposures. So we used the GAD7 to determine the anxiety levels, while PHQ-9 was used to determine the depression levels of the participants. And then we categorized them to no minimal, mild, moderate, and severe. These are the two uh, standard screening tools for anxiety and depression. For the outcome measurements, we added the participants self-reported social media during and after their work shift and they were categorized into zero to two hours, greater than two hours to four, and then more than four, four hours. In here, we listed all the confounding factor variables that we controlled during the model building. The age, the relationship status, educational attainment, religion, nationality, work experience, months on the current contract, and employment level. The variables six to seven were uh, considered as the occupational uh, uh, factors relating to the mental health of the participants. Okay, for the data analysis, as, as always, we use descriptive statistics to compute for the demographic profile anxiety and depression levels, and as well as the daily social media usage. The association between the depression and anxiety levels on the daily social media usage were estimated using the ordinal logistic regression. In a cross-sectional study design, we use uh, ordinal since we have an ordered outcome, the 0 to 2, uh, greater than uh, 2 to 4, and then greater than 4. And we also use the ordinal logistic regression models to account for the heterogeneity of the overall anxiety and depression levels of the seafarers with parallel lines assumptions. We reported the effect estimates as proportional ads ratio with 95% confidence interval. For the results, uh, table one shows the characteristics of the study population. Um, adults comprise uh, more uh, of the study population uh, with, who were greater than 25 years old. Uh, most of them were not in a relationship and they were at least uh, all college graduates. And account group two, which has the uh, time spent on social media hours of greater than two to four, 
uh, accounts for the highest proportion. So we stratify the characteristics of the participants according to the outcome. Okay, most of them were also Catholics. I mean, seven out of seven out of them, seven out of ten of them were Catholics, and eighty eight percent of them were Filipinos. And seafarers who were in service for less than ten years comprised the highest proportions across all groups. More than half of them, uh, more than half of them were in staff level, or six out of ten were staff level, and six out of them also were in contract for less than six months. For the out, uh, exposure uh, assessment, the uh, anxiety and the depression. Seven out of ten of them did not have anxiety, and six out of ten did not have uh, depression. On the other hand, one case of uh, anxiety was recorded, and two cases of severe anxiety, uh, depression, were recorded. Okay, for the ordinal logistic regression model results, this is uh, the figure. Uh, the figure shows the likelihood for the daily social media usage. Seafarers with mild to severe depression were more likely to use uh, social media compared to participants who had no to minimal depression by forty five percent. They were more likely to use social media. On the other hand, participants who were more than twenty five years old were twice more likely to use social media compared to those belonging to 21 to 25 years old. Uh, same results were, were also noted for those participants who were in a relationship. They were twice more likely to use social media compared to those who were not in a relationship. Moreover, Filipinos were three times more likely to use social media compared to non-Filipinos with a proportional ads ratio of 3.41. And here you can see also the 95% confidence interval. Participants who were working for less than 10 years were almost five times, okay, five times more likely to use social media compared to those who were working for more than 10 years already with a proportional ads ratio of 4.87. On the other hand, for the effect of anxiety on, on the social media usage, participants who had mild to severe anxiety were twice more likely to use social media compared to those without anxiety levels. On the other hand, same results observed for those who were more than 25 years old. They were twice more likely to use social media compared to those participants belonging to 21 to 25 years old age bracket. On the other hand, those who were in a relationship were twice more likely to use social media compared to those who were not in a relationship. Filipinos, on the other hand, were three times more likely to, compare, to use social media compared to non-Filipino descents. The, the same results uh, yielded for the, the effect of depression on uh, social media usage. And those who were working for less than 10 years as seafarers tend to use social media more by five times, almost five times, with a proportional ads ratio of 4.72 compared to those who were working for more than 10 years already. Okay, according to Melby and Carter at 2017, there are insufficient empirical researches relating to seafarers' mental health. Uh, are particularly uh, read one article by Simpson and Ellis 2020 that it is estimated that 1.8% of Filipino seafarers have psychiatric cases, specifically depression and anxiety, across a review of medical records for five years. It is uh, also said that social isolation of the cargo seafarers they are experiencing may lead to depression and anxiety, according to Abaya 2015. 2015, and the use of social media may be one way to combat this. In a study of Goya and Griffiths 2020, they suggest that there exists a strong correlation between the social anxiety and social media usage among male respondents, which was confirmed by previous studies wherein reports have shown that there is a coexistence between social media 
and social anxiety. And a longitudinal study on Flemish adolescents reports show that depressive symptoms of the participants increases their tendency to post more pictures on Instagram, thereby increasing their social media usage. This is a study done by Frieson and Egermord in 2017. Our study, which showed the increase in social media usage of, because of anxiety and depression among cargo seafarers, may be attributed to their urge to seek social support because of, as I said earlier, prolonged isolation. A study suggested that the increase in social anxiety increases social media as a way of regulating, challenging, or escaping social fears. In another study by Oberts and others in 2017, the levels of depression had a direct effect on the use of social networking sites because depression triggers the participants to have higher social media usage. So what are the future directions of this type of studies? Okay, our study, to our knowledge, is the first cross-sectional study to examine the effect of depression and anxiety among cargo seafarers who were mostly Filipinos. I read one article, but uh, but that study uh, uh, undergraduate thesis from one university in Manila, which uh, used small sample size and did not have a standard screening tool. The underlying reason on the increase of SMU among cargo seafarers may be validated by future qualitative studies because uh, quali there are some information and uh, data that can be captured using qualitative, similar to my current studies, which we use qualitative uh, uh, study design to assess the effect of these mental health disorders on the students in the Philippines and future longitudinal studies on anxiety and depression, which may use higher sample size on the effect of depression and anxiety on daily social media usage may warrant our findings. Okay, what are the limitations? Our study did not illustrate the mechanism of the risk factors of social media usage. Uh, residual confounding factor bias should not be neglected. Uh, because this is a cross-sectional study design, the temporal link between the outcome and the exposure cannot be determined because both were examined at the same time. In terms of generalizability, our study is limited to other occupational groups, so this cannot be generalized to other occupational groups, children, teenagers, women, and races, because we only involve male cargo seafarers composed mostly of Filipinos. Okay, what is the significance of these types of studies? Okay, now the impact of mental health illness and the social media on workers' occupational health cannot be overstated. And the effect of increasing social media among workers such as cargo seafarers due to the mental health disorders may interfere with their work. It is said that the higher you use social media, the more it interferes with your work productivity. Depression and anxiety have adverse consequences, including impaired social relationship, increased substance abuse, and suicide. Therefore, our study, thus the levels of social media usage, may be used as an indicator by the seafaring human resource management to examine the levels of depression and anxiety among seafarers. The ship operators should consider the factors that would support the mental well-being of cargo seafarers because as we all know, they are very at risk for two mental health disorders because of prolonged isolation. And this would create a better work-life balance and sustain very good relationship with family, relatives, and friends. Therefore, we may avoid unwanted outcomes such as what I have said earlier, suicide and men, uh, substance abuse. In conclusion, the seafarers experience anxiety and depression, which may increase their daily social media usage. Age, relationship status, nationality, and work experience may suggest a significant increase in daily SMU. And the results of our study that suggest the link between the mental health indicators, particularly anxiety and depression, and the daily, daily social media usage may help develop preventative strategies for at-risk populations such as cargo seafarers. Uh, before I end this, I would like to thank my PhD advisor, uh, Dr. Emmanuel Baha, for encouraging me uh, to talk in, uh, in front of you, and Arian Zamora for the 
research help. Uh, these are all the references I cited. And thank you very much. Thank you, Cypher, very, very much. This is a very important topic, you know, not only for seafarers, but for a lot of people. Um, I know we have reserved our questions for the later part, but there is one question, Cypher, that came from, you, from a YouTube viewer. Um, Cypher, are you still there? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Ma okay. So this question uh, is from Julius. So he's curious, where the syntax and commutativity of anxiety, depression, and social media usage been also considered? Do these have any interesting insight in that reverse correlation? Hello, ma'am. Thank you for that question, oh, Miss Universe. Anyway, we published the reverse side of this because we all know this is a bidirectional uh, study. Since social media usage may drive your anxiety and depression, and depression and anxiety may drive your social media usage. The first one, the question of Julius, thank you for that question, how social media drives your anxiety and depression levels. We already published that article in the International Maritime Health. I can give Julius a copy if he wants. Uh, so there is an effect. So increasing, uh, therefore, the increase in social media, uh, the increase in anxiety, therefore, and depression also increases, uh, sorry, pardon, erase. The increase in, the increase in social media usage increases the anxiety and depression levels as well. So that is a bidirectional process. Social media and the anxiety and depression levels. The one Julius mentioned, we already published that in an International Maritime Health Journal. Thank you, Cypher. And uh, we'll give you the email of Zypher if you want to ask him more questions or to elucidate more. But we will go to the next speaker now. Our next speaker is Dr. Renzo Ginto, um, a doctor of public health. He is the Associate Professor of the Practice of Global Public Health and Inaugural Director of the Planetary and Global Health Program of St. Luke's Medical Center College of Medicine. Concurrently, he is also the Chief Planetary Health Scientist and co-founder of the newly established Sunway Center for Planetary Health in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. He is also an Associate Researcher at the Copenhagen School of Global Health in Denmark and Senior Research Fellow at the Ateneo School of Government in the Philippines. He will talk about the advancing climate and health research in the Philippines, priorities and considerations in the age of COVID-19. Dr. Ginto. Thank you very much, Mami Yasmin. It's really great to see you again. And uh, it's like a reunion of our Rex 11 family. So I'm really thrilled to be uh, joining uh, such an amazing panel. No, I myself learned a lot no, from molecules. And now we're going to talk about the planet. No, uh, What a spectrum. So I hope you can see now my slides. <clears throat> uh, for the next couple of minutes, um, I'll not be presenting a specific research project. Uh, but I will be um, discussing the state of play when it comes to climate and health, the climate and health nexus, especially in the context of the Philippines, and identify some priorities, some considerations for you know, the research agenda for the next 10 years at least, um, and also share some updates on what's happening um, in, this, in this young area. Uh, and perhaps later on, we can explore how we can collaborate. I understand we have uh, participants, colleagues from both the U.S. and the Philippines. And I think it will be great to explore how we can work together in addressing perhaps this um, you know, defining existential threat of our uh, age. Um, and so I just want to remind everyone that in August, uh, the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, 
release the uh, sixth uh, report, you know, their sixth report, their sixth uh, assessment report. And basically, they were able to refine and update the state of evidence. And basically, what they're saying is, we're now on code red. You know, we're fast approaching the uh, planetary limits when it comes to climate change. You can see in these uh, very uh, creatively done uh, maps that uh, extreme weathers and um, heavy precipitation, etc., are already felt in every part of the world. So there's no um, region of the world that is immune to climate change. We've also seen that even places like Germany are uh, susceptible or vulnerable to extreme flooding, similar to places like the Philippines, uh, but also we already saw, um, you know, uh, over the past uh, years, uh, wildfires in Australia, in California, hurricanes in the Caribbean, and of course, the uh, continuous uh, inundation of the islands in the Pacific, uh, which um, increases their risk of being uh, erased from the face of the earth if climate change will not be averted in the, in the next decade. Of course, we're familiar with this map. Uh, Southeast Asia is a climate hotspot. In this map, as you can see, the redder the country is, the more vulnerable the country is to the hazards brought about by climate change. And unfortunately, guess which one is the reddest of them all? Our beloved Philippines, Lupang Hinirang, is at the heart of the climate crisis. And one of the aspects of the climate crisis that we, um, you know, rarely discuss, you know, uh, even in the national climate discourse, this is still not very much prominent, is the intersection between climate change and health. This is from uh, the Lancet Commission published in 2015. As you can see, there are multiple pathways that link climate change to human health. There are many arrows from storms to drought, uh, to flooding, to extreme heat, heat waves. All of these will lead to a wide range of health impacts. And as you can see on the right, you know, similar to uh, the, my earlier statement that no country is immune to climate change, there's no disease group that is immune to climate change. You know, we know, and, and, and this is pretty much uh, you know, more established, the links between climate change and infectious diseases, vector-borne diseases, malaria, dengue, Zika, chikungunya, uh, water-borne diseases, food-borne diseases, et cetera. And of course, there's now a growing discussion about uh, the... Uh, role of climate change in also increasing the risk for future pandemics. Uh, of course, cardiovascular diseases, chronic non-communicable diseases are also, are also on the rise and climate change and environmental change uh, have something to do with it, uh, especially with uh, continuous rise in uh, air pollution, uh, poor air quality, which can lead to you know, cardiorespiratory diseases, but also exposure to extreme heat can also lead to heat stroke and other forms of heat-related illness. Undernutrition um, is, is also going to be uh, exacerbated. Uh, the Lancet actually estimated that there will be a 50 years worth of global gains in nutrition that can be reversed, again, if climate change will not be stopped. And of course, there's growing evidence on the impacts on mental health as well. Later on, I have a specific slide on that. So I already mentioned about the links between, between climate change and, and uh, infectious diseases. Uh, that's, that's quite uh, you know, pretty established. And we need to do more research in this arena, especially in the Philippines, which is a tropical country, um, a hotspot for infectious disease. Um, and of course, you know, over the past year and a half, we've seen and I think this is most glaring and most palpable in places like the Philippines, we've seen the confluence of the climate crisis and the COVID crisis. You have fellow Filipinos, the underserved and the marginalized facing the dilemma. On one hand, do I stay in the house, protect myself from COVID, uh, but uh, you know, perhaps my house might get inundated by the ex intense flooding or the roof might be blown away by the strong wind. On the other hand, do I move to these cramp evacuation centers. As you can see, there's no social distancing in these temporary shelters. Um, and uh, while protected from the climate risk, from you know, climate-related disasters, there is a very high chance that you can contract the unseen coronavirus. So this is a real dilemma in places like the Philippines. And as we live in a, in a world of increasing pandemic risk, but also 
exacerbating uh, climate condition. We need to uh, look into uh, these two issues, uh, in fact, even in an integrated manner. So what is the state of climate and health research worldwide? This is a very recent um, you know, systematic analysis of climate and health research done by colleagues at the London School. They use mach machine learning uh, approaches. And as you can see, you know, uh, there, are, there are studies already conducted uh, growing by each year. Um, in the Philippines, as you can see, not as you know, dark red as we want. Uh, using the color coding here, but we're also not uh, lagging behind. You know, we're not uh, starting from scratch. Although many of these studies that included the Philippines are one, multi-country studies that have been led by Global North institutions. Again, colleagues from um, you know universities in North America and Europe, and which which happen to use some Philippine data, um, and. Uh, and, and that means we still have very limited research coming from the Philippines itself uh, in, uh, in terms of climate change in general, but also climate and health in particular. And another scoping review done by colleagues uh, from here in the Philippines have only identified 34 studies that look into the Philippines and were done by Filipinos. Um, and as you can see, the literature is pretty scant. Uh, a lot of them focusing on specific impacts. Um, for example, infectious diseases is quite a favorite for obvious reasons. Uh, but there are other areas that are very little uh, examined uh, in the Philippine context. For instance, as you can see below, more on the, uh, the adaptation approaches to the impacts of climate change on human health. We somehow have an idea of the problems. We have very little evidence on the solutions. And of course, the co-benefits. When we say co-benefits, these are the benefits to health that result from the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. So if we reduce greenhouse gas emissions, you know, climate, the climate will be better and our health will be better as well. And there's, there's zero evidence uh, on, on that uh, interconnection. Uh, by the way, I forgot to mention in the previous slide that the bulk of the research is focused on infectious diseases and some of the areas that are really uh, under-examined are, for example, the impact of climate change on maternal and child health, the impact of climate change on mental health, the impact of climate change on heat-related illness, um, and I have other issues that I will be raising in the next few slides. So I already mentioned heat health. Uh, and, and heat health is, is something that perhaps a tropical country like the Philippines is not uh, you know, really considering very explicitly. We're more familiar with uh, hotter temperatures compared to uh, other people, for example, in temperate countries in Europe, North America, down in Australia, especially during winter. Uh, but in, in, in a world of increasing heat, we need to start looking at how do we make sure that the Filipinos uh, do not suffer from the health consequences of extreme heat? And what adaptation measures can we do to make sure uh, that we are able to uh, you know, survive such extreme temperatures over the next 10, 20, 30, uh, 50 years? So as you can see in this uh, you know, graphic, Asia in general is becoming redder uh, as, as climate change continues to exacerbate. So heat health is one. Another area, of course, is, is you know, the nexus of food, nutrition, and, and health, and climate. Um, and of course, there's already growing recognition that um, in, in the world of climate change, in a, in a warming planet, uh, the Philippines uh, uh, farmlands, croplands, uh, will uh, it, their ability to feed our people, to produce uh, healthy, nutritious, sustainable food uh, will be imperiled. And so we need to start looking at how we can ensure that our nutritional gains are not reversed, uh, and nutrition improvement continues. By the way, we still have very high rates of undernutrition, stunting, hunger in this country, uh, despite not being uh, a poor country. I believe the Philippines is not a poor country. Um, and of course, when we lo look at food systems, we cannot just look at terrestrial food systems. We need to also look at the marine food systems. The Philippines is an, is an archipelagic country. A bulk of our population depends on um, marine uh, food uh, resources. And of course, we know that in a warming planet, oceans uh, will be both uh, acidified and also increasing in temperature. 
and that will uh, kill coral reefs, the forests of the sea, and even eventually reduce to uh, lead to a reduction of uh, you know fish uh, stocks, which can then lead to protein deficiencies, uh, especially in coastal communities in the Philippines. Protein deficiency resulting from climate-induced um, ocean change is already documented in other parts of the world, in, Bang in uh, Madagascar and other Pacific islands. And then, of course, when we look at the food system, we need to look at it from a very holistic way. Um, right now, we have a very defective food system that is creating what is now called the global syndemic. Syndemic means that there are multiple epidemics uh, that are interacting with each other, reinforcing each other as well. And they have the same uh, causes, uh, same uh, underlying drivers. So what is the syndemic that the food system that we have now is producing? On one hand, uh, 2 billion people on earth are overweight and obese. So that is a reflection of the overconsumption of food. Of course, obesity and overweight is not just due to food, uh, but food uh, consumption and uh, the inequitable distribution of food has a huge role to play in this new um, pandemic event. Uh, of course, another billion people on earth are also under undernourished, experiencing different kinds of nutritional deficiencies. And that is, of course, resulting from underconsumption of healthy, nutritious food. So that you have these two epidemics happening at the same time. And then the third problem is that of climate change because these food systems are also emitting a large amount of greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, especially meat production. Um, and, um, and, and, and also these uh, food systems are using a lot of water, land, and, and energy uh, and also polluting water, land, and, and air. So as you can see, the food system in general, very defective creating a global syndemic. And so we have to go beyond nutritional supplementation if we want to address food, nutrition, and health in the era of climate change. Another under-examined area of the climate and health nexus is the impacts of sea level rise on health. So when we talk about climate change, we only usually think about the extreme weather events like typhoons or intense flooding, storm surges, you might remember Typhoon Haiyan and, of course, all the extreme weather events that the Philippines has experienced over the past um, you know, decades. But we should not forget that one of the slow onset effects of climate change is the rising of the sea, uh, rising of the sea level. Uh, due to many reasons, the ice caps in the Arctic and Antarctic are melting. Uh, the uh, again, the ocean is warming, and and uh, and and all these factors and more uh, are leading to uh, the slow, gradual but sure um, rise in the sea level, which can then lead to um, seawater intrusion. When the seawater enters uh, the groundwater, the freshwater systems in coastal areas, that can lead to uh, the increasing salinization of drinking water. And actually, there's a growing evidence on the impacts of increasing salinity of water on health. We did a very rapid review of studies. There are only around 30 studies worldwide uh, and, and very young. They've all been do done for the past 10 years alone. Majority are from Bangladesh. There's one study from Vietnam, but there's no study from the Philippines, which is by the way, the country that is facing the fastest rate of sea level rise in the world. And so now we're talking to the Climate Change Commission to really invest in salinity and health research. Uh, I've seen firsthand in my uh, you know, work in some coastal municipalities that people are already uh, complaining of water wells already high in salt content. But this needs to be investigated, documented, so that we can find adaptation solutions, especially for these impoverished communities. Oh, by the way, I, just to give you a, a, a brief uh, enumeration of the effects. So some of the, the effects that are already being uh, noticed are uh, the increase in hypertension. So before we get hypertension from high salt food, now you're getting it from high salt water. Of course, related to it is preeclampsia and gestational hypertension, uh, which can lead to miscarriages as well. Um, and there's also growing evidence on infant and neonatal mortality due to um, uh, for example, increase in waterborne diseases um, and also increasing um, kidney disease uh, because of, as you can see there, 
uh, the you know macro mineral deposits, you know, in in the uh, nephro urinary system. And then, of course, you know, it's it's not just that your water systems get intruded and salinized. Um, your communities can totally get inundated. That will uh, mean that people will be forcibly displaced. And we need a clear plan as to how we will um, ensure a dignified uh, migration of people living in the coastlines. Um, again, if climate change will not be averted, we need to be thinking of you know, some worst case scenarios that have already been uh, identified by climate scientists. So this is what's going to happen with the city of Manila. And there are so many other coastal cities and municipalities that are at risk of being underwater uh, by 2050 and beyond. And as I mentioned a while ago, one of the growing areas of climate and health research is climate change and mental health. This is from a report from the Imperial College London that I collaborated in. Uh, we tried to identify what are the different pathways that link climate change to mental health. And so I'm really thrilled to hear uh, a while ago Zypher talking about the mental health of seafarers. I think, um, you know, to, ex to expand on that, we need to start looking at how climate change is affecting our brains and hearts and how we can make sure that in our pursuit of better mental health, we are actually also ensuring uh, a healthy planet. Uh, and, and that for sure has a, um, you know, a very uh, important, uh, that leads or generates a very positive, uh, positively reinforcing uh, feedback loop. You know, healthy planet leads to healthy brains and healthy brains and minds will help protect the climate. And, you know, as you can see here, some of the mental health uh, impacts or the pathways are one through the extreme weather events, which is more familiar uh, to the Philippine context, um, when a typhoon or a disaster happens, there's post-traumatic stress and other forms of psychological sequelae. And then you also have, um, and then now there's a growing attention to the slow onset mental health effects. You're a farmer, you're not anymore producing the food that you, um, you know, are expecting to harvest because of intense heat, uh, drought. And that creates some form of, you know, here's a new term, eco-anxiety or climate grief or um, and, and many other uh, new psychological entities, again, resulting from, you know, the impacts of climate change, the uncertainty that it brings um, and the, uh, manifest, the manifesting effects uh, of climate change uh, or, or effects that are manifesting in front of your very eyes. So this is a very, very new uh, science. <clears throat> So I'm proceeding to the second half of my you know, talk. And the question now is, are we ready to build health systems that consider the climate? And that includes, are we ready to do health research that consider the climate? Okay. And so you know, one of the frameworks that we can uh, embrace in, in this pursuit is the concept of climate smart health or climate smart healthcare. Climate smart is a climate change uh, terminology it refers to the convergence of adaptation and mitigation. Mitigation means we're reducing our greenhouse gas emissions, our carbon emissions, so that climate change does not exacerbate, does not aggravate. On the other hand, we need to start talking about adaptation, which means putting in place systems that have the ability to respond and tackle the effects of climate change, especially the inevitable ones. Unfortunately, with a slow pace of action in you know, in terms of reduction of greenhouse gases, we know that, you know, in, in November, COP26, the climate negotiations will be happening in Glasgow. They're still talking about how to reduce carbon emissions. Um, and, and they've been doing that for 26 years. And so it's, it's important for the health sector to start thinking, how can we build health systems that will not just help reduce our emissions, but also enhance our resilience uh, to the effects of climate change. And so this is just a Venn diagram showing to you what are the things that we can do. I'll not elaborate, but if you're interested, um, this document from the World Bank uh, is Googleable. So we just started an international collaborative under Health Systems Global. It's the International Society of Health Policy and Systems Researchers. And we established this new uh, working group on climate resilient and sustainable health systems. So if you're very interested in you know, working collaboratively internationally on how to build health systems that bend but do not break, 
in the era of climate change, please join us. It's a very international uh, community. We're going to start a project uh, very soon uh, with the University of California, San Francisco on building climate resilient local health systems. We wanna make sure that all these global and national conversations are trickled down to the local level. We know in the Philippines, we have a decentralized health system. Local health systems are at the front lines of the climate crisis and also of the public health crisis. And so we need to make sure that we build climate resilient local health systems in our municipalities. We're going to work with three municipalities. We are going to conduct rapid climate health needs assessment. We will examine their climate change plan. We want to make sure that it has a very strong health component. We will um, train them and work with them on climate and health budgeting to ensure that, you know, in the next years and decades, they have put in place systems that can ensure they can address the health impacts of climate change, such as the ones that I mentioned a while ago. We're working with GIZ, which is the German Development Agency, on this new concept of climate services for health. What is climate services? Climate services are climate data, climate information that are useful for a particular sector. This time, we want it to be useful for the health sector. We wanna make sure that the municipal health officer can read climate data and also interpret that so that it gets incorporated into health planning and decision-making. You know, where is the next outbreak going to happen? What is the future uh, state of sea level rise in my community, in my locale? So that health planning is also not based just merely on annual budget cycles or electoral cycles, elections are upcoming, but also based on, you know, long-term, uh, you know, foresight. You know, we have an idea of what's going to happen in the next 10 to 20 years, and we can already put some the investments needed to ensure climate resilience of the health sector in the decades to come. So we're now investigating some of the readily available, um, you know, technologies, uh, digital platforms that has climate information, and we're seeing how can they be useful for the health sector. So as you can see, this is a map of actually my hometown. I'm from Kalamba. I'm right now from Kalamba, and it's quite appalling to see that actually a lot of our health centers will get inundated if the worst case scenario for flooding happens in my hometown. And so this is very informative and we want to make sure that every municipal health officer or provincial health officer in the country is comfortable with listen, uh, using, consuming climate information. We're starting to look at how climate change is going to affect the delivery uh, of, of health services for different health conditions. So this is a paper that is upcoming that we develop on the impact, the links between climate change and HIV AIDS, okay? There's no direct connection between climate change and the virus, but there's so many different pathways uh, by which climate change is going to affect health, uh, HIV AIDS services, you know, susceptibility of patients, et cetera. Uh, so this is from uh, a keynote that I delivered in the International AIDS Society early this year. And of course, as I mentioned already, climate change and mental health is a growing science. We now have an international collaborative with Imperial College London, along with other collaborators from around the world. And we are rolling out a national online cross-sectional survey of uh, 18 to 24 years, year olds uh, in, in all these countries to see how the climate crisis and the COVID crisis are um, uh, you know, collectively and, and um, um, co uh, co um, integratedly affecting mental health and psychological responses of young people. So um, this is very ex a very exciting research that we will be starting very soon. Um, the Lancet, which is uh, for, for the medical doctors in the room, we know uh, is, is a world-renowned medical journal, they launched a Lancet countdown to track progress on health and climate change. So they're already on their fifth or sixth year. They're releasing the report in a few weeks' time. But for 2022, mm -hmm. we actually hope to bring the Lancet countdown to the Philippines to produce a national report. And then from then on, we will do an annual reporting of climate and health progress in the Philippines. So to the climate and health researchers or to the public health researchers here interested in climate change, we would love to collaborate because we're now building the uh, scientific group. Uh, and we want to make sure it represents different disciplines, different disease, disease issues, et cetera, um, in the Philippines. So it will be uh, led by uh, my home institution, St. Luke's. 
of course, we have to start looking at the, as I mentioned, the health co-benefits of climate mitigation. When we reduce carbon in the different sectors, in the energy sector, in the transport sector, in uh, agriculture and forestry, uh, in the you know, urban design, for example, what are the benefits to health that can be reaped by the Filipino people? So this is another, as I've said a while ago, zero research in this area. We hope to do more in the coming years. Of course, we need to take advantage of the COVID moment. You know, this is a report that we will be releasing uh, in COP26 in, in Glasgow this uh, November. It's about the nexus of COVID and climate. How can we use the COVID moment to introduce climate smart healthcare? Uh, and as you can see, looking at the pandemic uh, response uh, you know, cycle, uh, there are so many things that we can already do and incorporate to make sure that we're leapfrogging, we're taking advantage of the COVID solutions to make sure we have a climate smart healthcare system in the future. And then this is a report that we also published um, uh, early this year uh, during Earth Month. Uh, we uh, introduced the concept of green UHC. How can we make sure that universal healthcare uh, in the coming years will be achieved while at the same time we're decarbonizing the health sector. 4.4% of the emissions of the world are coming from the global health sector. We want to make sure we're not accomplished the crime. And so here we identified seven high impact actions, renewable energy, green building design, um, you know, zero emissions from transport of patients and staff, uh, sustainable food systems, sustainable procurement of pharmaceuticals and other materials, waste management, all of these can lead, can, can contribute significantly to the decarbonization of the health sector. And we're now looking into how we can localize it in the Philippine setting. Because universal healthcare and climate action are deeply connected. This is one connection that we're not talking about very much. We need UHC as an adaptation measure to make sure that Filipinos have access to healthcare in a warming planet. But we also need climate action to make sure there's less burden on UHC. We know that more diseases will be more costly for universal healthcare systems. And both of these will lead to the improvement of health and the achievement of health equity in our country. So to close my talk, um, I'm sure this is a very familiar graph. We need to flatten the curve of COVID-19. And we also need to increase our healthcare systems capacity by adding more beds, recruiting more nurses, and of course today by rolling out more vaccines. But I think we need to flatten this curve too, the curve of our carbon emissions, our ecological footprint. But the major difference is that unlike the health systems capacity, the earth, the earth systems capacity cannot be uh, uh, increased or extended or changed. It's non-negotiable. And so the only curve that we can manipulate is our curve, you know, our curve of carbon emissions and sustainability should indeed be a priority. And we need to take advantage, as I've said, of the COVID recovery process. Although I think maybe in the Philippines, it's still far-fetched to think about recovery since we are still in response phase. But as we proceed to the post-COVID world, we need to make sure that all the investments that we're having are also preparing us for a green, healthy, and just future, uh, and a climate-smart, climate-resilient future as well. And that's why, you know, over the past five years, there's a growing acceptance and, and appreciation and recognition of the need to expand the public health approach to now what we call the planetary health approach. And in public health, as we know, our patients are the population, human populations. But in planetary health, we have now have two patients, people and planet. We need an integrated vision for the health of the human civilization and the health of the ecosystems on which we depend. So I invite you to join us. We have a Planetary Health Philippines growing network, a community of planetary health advocates, scholars, leaders, practitioners, young people in the Philippines. Uh, Google planetaryhealth.ph. That is our Lancet commentary introducing the community to the international you know, community. Um, and these are the fa many faces of our growing community because we owe it to our children and to the children who are yet to come. We need to find ways. We need to do research and action that will safeguard the health of the future Filipino children and the future children of the world entire. So together, let's advance the health of people and planet. Thank you for listening. And I look forward to your conversation. Thank you, Dr. Ginto. As usual, very comprehensive 
scary. It, it opens the mind and the eyes to possibilities, um, not just the problems, but the solutions, which I always like in your talks, because you know, at the beginning you become depressed because of all of these problems, and then you give the solutions, which which is very good. Now, Dr. Al Serafika has a, has a comment. Please, Al, if you're there, can you um, speak? Uh, yeah, just wanted to, uh, I'm always uh, grateful for Lenzo when he presents. Uh, he gives a very comprehensive uh, uh, picture for, for that matter. Uh, but I think part of what I wanted to say, Lenzo, is that we are, I mean, in Pase, where there's a lot of engineers and scientists, and we need kind of, or lack of a better word, dumb it down for us <laughs> in terms of what we can do. I think Ivy is also of the same opinion. Uh, but, uh, uh, but I think that that's where the current gap for me, and it clicked when you told me salinity al will affect health and hypertension. I was in Israel looking at infiltration of wells with salt water that did a water management for 30 years including rain catchment and all of the other activities in terms of preserving water for irrigation and wastewater processing. So to me, those are the kinds of, uh, uh, I would say, specifics uh, that I would love to be able to connect from the planetary health side to the actual actionable items that scientists and engineers can do in order to be able to be interested to be part of the solution. And I did see some of your slides later down the road, but I still need to kind of dissect it and be able to uh, go into real actionable specifics so we can recruit more engineers <laughs> into your fold, I would say. So if you can get me to understand that, okay, may magagawa pala ako, then that will probably come a long way for us to say, okay, we'll join Renzo in his crusade. <laughs> but yes. I just want to say that. Thank you. <laughs> yes, we will. And there's also a comment from the chair, from one of the chairs of uh, Rec 11. Um, are you still there, Dr. Lopena? Please. Always a pleasure to listen to Renzo. Very good and comprehensive presentation. And, and as everyone probably agrees, you present us with uh, what can be done. So in that light, I'm just sharing that we are also preparing to launch the Healthy Climate Prescription Letter on Monday. Uh, that's 5 o'clock p.m. Geneva time, together with the WHO report on the health argument for climate action. Um, this is an offshoot of the uh, co-published article in over 200 journals um, worldwide. So this is a continuing action. And some of you may have signed this document or this letter as well. Uh, there you go. So of course, Renzo is a signatory. There you go. So um, thank, thank you. you, sir. Thank you, sir. Nice to see you again. <laughs> Teacher Koyan, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, there are still a few more comments, but we'll wait until the end. We have one more speaker, and then I will call on those who still have comments. Um, our last speaker uh, will talk on something on pharmaceuticals still, but biologics. Dr. Uh, Galivo is a regulatory scientist working for the US federal government. He is responsible for the scientific reviews of biologic products, including cellular, tissue engineered, and gene therapy products. So he will talk about one of these products. Prior to joining the federal government, Dr. Galivo had conducted postgraduate research in virology, immunology, cell and gene therapy. He obtained his PhD in virology and gene therapy from the Mayo Clinic. His medical degree is from the University of the Philippines, Manila, while his bachelor's of science in molecular biology and biotechnology was from the University of the Philippines, Diliman. 
So let us have Dr. Galivo and his talk on reprogramming human gallbladder cells into insulin producing beta-like cells. Dr. Galivo, please. Hello, good, good evening, everybody. Good morning, Mangataga uh, Pilipinas. Uh, I'm really excited to, uh, to share my project, my postdoctoral research project to all of you guys. Um, I commend all the speakers that have provided a lot of such, such excellent uh, talks so far, and also commend Rec 11 for a very uh, mo well moderated um, a session. So let me just pull out my presentation. Is my audio uh, okay to you guys? You sound great. Okay, thank you. So I'll be talking about uh, reprogramming of human gallbladder cells into insulin producing beta cells. Um, this project has been part of my postdoctoral training at Oregon Health and Science University. It has been published um, four years ago in PLOS One. So I'll be talking about uh, mostly diabetes mellitus, uh, some background about it, and alternative sources for cell therapy for for uh, for diabetes. Uh, we have developed other cells as an alternative source of the cell therapy for for diabetes, and as well as about the pancreatic reprogramming that they did for this work, as well as main subscription factors we use for for the project, as well as uh, we use adenovirus mediated gene delivery for this project. And uh, based on that, I'll be also talking about the characterization of these reprogrammed cells which we call reprogrammed gallbladder cells, looking at the uh, transcriptome analysis, as well as the microRNA profile of these reprogrammed cells. And finally, we also use a uh, cell marker for islet cells. It's been very useful in terms of enriching for these reprogrammed cells to be like uh, islet like cells or beta, beta, uh, beta cells. And finally, I'll be summarizing on my data. So just to begin with diabetes analysis, as we, everybody, everybody's familiar with, it is a group of metabolic disorders characterized by hyperglycemia or very high glucose levels. And you also have, sometimes you have reduced insulin secretion and there's reduced glucose uptake as well as increased glucose production as well. So long-term effects include pathology in multiple organ systems. We know complications include, could include uh, kidneys, retina, the cardiovascular system and nervous system as well. So in this particular project, uh, we're really looking into the uh, treatment for type 1 diabetes. As you know, the type 1 diabetes is um, characterized by increased glucose caused by autoimmune uh, destruction of the beta cells. As you can see on the left side here, schematic diagram showing the loss of uh, beta cells, uh, but still the islet is still intact with other, other, uh, other um, hormonal cells present. And, and the graph below showing that the, uh, the destruction of the beta cells up to 80%, that's only when you see an overt expression of the diabetes in sub in this patient. So for treatment, uh, exogenous insulin is the main thing of treatment, but it's not always sufficient to control high, high blood glucose, especially hypoglycemic events. And also there is a problem of chronic and organ complications to still be concerned for this. Um, another treatment is a whole pancreas or islet cell transplantation. Uh, the upside of this one is that uh, there's a physiologic glucose regulation you minimize and organ damage. However, it's limited by the short supply of the uh, donors for this one, the cost, as well as the lifelong immunosuppression that's involved for these patients. Um, and finally, there's alternative, uh, increasing people are looking into alternative beta cell replacement for cell therapy, including um, differentiation of pluripotent stem cells, as well as uh, adult derived, rendered and derived derivatives of the cells, like the liver, the gallbladder and the pancreatic um, ductal cells. So an example of alternative cells that have been, um, have been used or been tested to, uh, to be reprogrammed for beta cells, uh, some have used in vivo reprogramming using viral vectors um, on this side um, uh, into beta cells using different factors like um, neurogenin, uh, MAF-A, and, um, and PDX1. I'll be talking more in detail about these factors as, as we go on a lot more talk. Other people have also looked into uh, direct uh, reprogramming of, uh, of biliary epithelial cells 
uh, in vitro, as well as liver cells from both human and mice. For this particular project, I will look into the gallbladder cells. And just a little bit um, more about the gallbladder cells. It is a pear-shaped sac that's located underneath your liver. It's an average capacity of 30 to 50 mils in volume. If you look at the, at the histology, there's, it's lined by single highly folded columnar epithelium that contains a lot of cholesterol and fat, and fat globules. And uh, it also produces a lot of mucin to protect the, uh, the layer from the from bile. The main function is to concentrate and store hepatic bile and to deliver this bile into the duodenum to respond to a meal. And one thing that's really, uh, that's really uh, unique to this organ is that you can, like the appendix, is that it is a dispensable organ. Theoretically, it's a potentially rich source of reprogrammable epithelial cells. People walk around without the gallbladder cells and they're still okay. So potentially we could uh, take this out for those um, people and then uh, reprogram them and uh, into, into insulin producing cells. So the rationale for looking into the uh, beta cell replacement, particularly the human gallbladder, is that the gallbladder and the endocrine cells of the pancreas, as well as the endocrine pancreas, they share a common progenitors in development. Uh, they're, 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 set, they're said to have a common pancreatic biliary progenitor, and that this ontogenic proximity to the pancreas is theoretically or hypothesized to be uh, a good way of uh, reprogramming these gallbladder cells because it will only take a few more steps to differentiate this into, into endocrine cells in the pancreas. As mentioned, um, it's, it's a dispensable organ. You can reprogram it, and also you can expand it to a really large number um, so, that, uh, so that it could be used for, for transplantation. Um, these days, other people are using three potent stem cells and differentiate them into different organs or tissues like neural cells as well as beta cells. Um, the advantage of using uh, non three potent stem cells like the gallbladder is that theoretically the risk of teratoma or tumor is lo lower. Um, this could be autologous. Uh, you can take the same gallbladder from the same patient without any encapsulation needed, without any, uh, theoretically without any immunosuppression needed. And that this particular methodology may be applicable in vivo reprogramming. Um, I mean that we could probably inject our vectors directly to the gallbladder and have an uh, in situ or in vivo reprogramming of those cells. So in terms of transcription factors, the main goal here is to, to use your transcription factors to, uh, to change a, a, one cell type to another, and this in, in this case, gallbladder and pancreatic beta cells. And uh, in this particular methodology or hypothesis that gallbladder cells probably will need uh, a few uh, transcription factors to change it into a beta cell like. I've seen in other studies that hepatic sites could be, um, could induce uh, production of insulin by expression of factors like PDX1, neurogen, and neurod. So in the same, in the same line of thinking that gallbladder cells, given the same progenitor or, 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 or lineage as the other endoderm uh, tissues, could potentially be changed into beta cells using different factors. What factors, would, we're not really sure about which factors could make, could efficiently make this process uh, effective. So that's really the goal of this study. So in this study, if you look at the right of the schematic diagram, from pancreatic progenitor cells, going down to development or differentiation to endocrine progenitors, these are all uh, entail different types of transcription factors that are expressed in those different cell types as they progress in development. Uh, for example, PDX1, is expressed in pancreatic progenitors as well as in um, mature beta cells. Uh, as you go along the development, as you differentiate into different cell types like alpha cells, uh, delta cells, and uh, PP cells, you, this involves expression or upregulation of different types of transcription factors. So this is really the, the theme of the reprogramming is that uh, trying to find out what's the, the optimal mix of transcription factors that could be efficient in changing one cell type to another. So we started with neurogenin-3, which is um, uh, expressed in, um, in progenitor cells. Uh, it's, uh, specified, it's, it's useful in the specification of endocrine lineages and developing pancreas, as well as in differentiation of adult pancreatic progenitors. As I mentioned, PDX1 is uh, found in developing pancreatic pan precursor cells, as well as in adult pancreatic beta cells. 
MAF A is um, found in in adult cells, uh, in, in beta cells, and they are said to control early and early and, and adult beta cell specific insulin expression. And finally, PAC6, uh, it's a specific factor that's important in development of the pancreas as well as other tissues like central nervous system. So what we did was to take out uh, human gallbladder cells from subjects or patients that are undergoing a cholecystectomy. And uh, we took out several tissues and harvested tissues and expanded them in vitro. Following expansion in vitro, we exposed them in, with different types of factors, different culture conditions, as well as our denoviral vector. So our main reprogramming is mainly based on genetic reprogramming, which is uh, mediated by the um, addition of, 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 of um, adenoviruses that are encoding for different um, factors like neurogenin 3, as mentioned, MAF-A, PAC-6, and PDX one At the same time, we're also providing growth factors that's been known to help uh, insulin production in, uh, in other cell types. Uh, this entails a 21-day process from cell expansion as to um, in, uh, transduction of the virus, as well as to uh, repeat the differentiation in, in vitro as well. So looking at the um, gene expression before reprogramming and comparing the levels of the different uh, markers for, for endocrine cell, cell types of the pancreas, as, as listed here, look at the, at the pink bars, which is for the adult beta cells, uh, meaning that the, uh, the primary gallbladder cells have been expanded in vitro, have deficient expression of these key pancreatic endocrine markers that's uh, highly expressed in adult beta cells. And after introduction of the different factors like PAC6, serogenin, combination of PDX1, MAF A, and PX, uh, PAC6, there wasn't really any insulin expression. Only when you combine the, uh, the factors PD PDX1, neurogenin, and MAF A that you see a slight upregulation of insulin. And this was enhanced by the addition of the PAC6 uh, in, the, in the process. And uh, on, the, on the far right here, you see the expression of insulin, which is a thousand fold hundredfold higher than what is reprogrammed. And uh, looking here at the relative mRNA expression of, of all the markers found in the, uh, on the islet cells, you see that um, after reprogramming, uh, there is an increase in terms of the expression of the insulin, NKX and other cell, beta cell markers, as well as other um, factors for found in islet cells. So this looking at the, uh, at the, at top, the, top, uh, the lower graphs, uh, the kinetics of the expression, the, 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 uh, the dotted line here expressed, meaning is the expression found in islet cells, that uh, reprogramming changes the uh, expression of these uh, key pancreatic endocrine markers, but it's not as uh, efficient in terms of insulin production or NKX at this point. Overall, when we look at the uh, general transcriptomic expression of the, uh, of the beta cells, compared to the reprogrammed cells here, it seems like the, uh, the global uh, mRNA expression of the reprogrammed cells mimic that of the real beta cells. And you contrast this uh, contrast with the regulation of the uh, of expression of the, different, of the different genes in the gallbladder cells. So clearly the, uh, administ uh, clearly the, the culture, as well as the transduction of the adenovirus with the factors are changing the, uh, the transcriptome of, the, uh, of these gallbladder cells into more like a beta cells. In addition, the, uh, looking at the mi microRNA profile of these reprogrammed cells, similarly, it mimics the, uh, the profile of beta cells here. And you see the contrast with, in terms of the, uh, the downregulated genes in the gallbladder cells, and they shifted to a more beta-like profile when you, uh, when you uh, reprogram these cells. And just by listing the different um, microRNA, the, the black uh, squares here showing that these are sort of quote unquote beta, beta specific microRNAs that the reprogram cells have higher expression of this. And in terms of the, the gallbladder cells, which are more enriched in the gallbladder cells, uh, there is less of that in the reprogram cells. And then looking at this uh, expression in terms of the protein, you see that C-peptide is actually expressed in some of the cells. Uh, we calculated to be around seven to ten percent of the reprogrammed cells, which you can see here. 
as well as the neuro D1 marker that there is co-localization of the C-peptide, NKX2, another uh, beta cell marker, as well as NKX6.1. However, we've also noticed that C-peptide expression is co-localized with somatostatin and ghrelin, which are produced by other hormonal cells in the islet, meaning that these reprogrammed cells are not 100% uh, monohormonal, but they also produce other hormones in the, uh, that are found in the islets. In terms of the functionality of this, of this reprogrammed cell, um, by, by, by challenging them, in terms of, the interest of, in terms of by challenging them with with glucose, there is an increase in terms of the responsiveness to glucose. And in terms of the overall insulin content, uh, there is an increase also as well compared to, uh, to, to, uh, uh, to the non reprogram cell. So uh, at this point, we had a reprogramming efficiency of around 7 to 12% by C peptide staining. And so we utilize a particular monoclonal antibody that's been used for flow cytometry enrichment of islet cells. And by using this particular HP1 surface antibody against pancreatic cells and enriching them using flow cytometry, we were able to show that there is an enrichment of this marker that's being stained by HP1 in these reprogrammed cells as opposed to non-reprogrammed cells. Uh, and if you look at the uh, protein expression of C-peptide with the marker for HP1, they actually merge, meaning that uh, the reprogramming process upregulates both the C-peptide and the marker for islet cells. So this is just a graph of the different uh, key endocrine markers like NK6.1, PCSK1, and looking at the HP1 positive cells or in the, in the blue bars, that there is an upregulated expression of these key markers and they are almost uh, similar or higher than the ones that are unsorted, or um, they are actually going toward, trend towards higher as opposed to, to the islet cells. So looking at the more enriched population with the HP1 positive cells, the transcriptome expression is actually more mimicking of the beta cells versus of the unsorted cells or the HP1 negative or the uh, un unreprogrammed cells. So the graph here is showing you different key markers whereby the HP1 cells actually have a higher up, uh, expression of the key markers um, that's mimicking the beta cells, or even higher in some of the, uh, of the beta cell markers. Similarly, when enriching for this particular surface antigen, the HP1 positive cells, the expression of microRNA mimics that of the beta cells, as shown here. And the ones that are marked uh, with stars on the right are just the microRNA, candidate microRNA that are not, um, that are not, that are not changed in the reprogrammed cells, but are highly expressed in beta cells. So these are potential targets for micro, uh, microRNA reprogramming, but potentially we could introduce this microRNA into these cells and hopefully see whether there's any increase in terms of differentiation towards an insulin uh, positive cells. And finally, we, we, uh, we look into the engraftment of these uh, reprogrammed gal butter cells. And by using different methodology like subcutaneous in, uh, injection, kidney capsule transplantation, as well as mammary fat, we've seen that these C peptide were, um, were found in the, uh, in the graph. However, they only lasted for, for several weeks. So to summarize the study, uh, we were able to expand human gal butter cells uh, for multiple unrelated donors in vitro. Um, we're able to transduce beta cell factors that resulted in insulin producing cell that's beta like in type based on gene expression profile, uh, based on microRNA profile as well. However, these, these cells are polyhormonal, but they are functional in terms of glucose responsiveness, and they can be engrafted for a short period of time. We were able to use a, a, a particular surface marker for islets that able to enrich for insulin positive cells. And finally, as mentioned, uh, based on this study, uh, there's a potential for microRNA reprogramming of these cells and for diabetes model progression. I would just like to thank um, my collaborators at Oregon Health and Science University, University of Pennsylvania, and Stanford University who contributed to this work.
Thank you so much, Dr. Thank Galindo, you. for this uh, cutting edge reprogramming. I'm quite sure you have follow up researches going on, correct? Um, actually, I'm, I'm done with the project and I move oh. on to government work. So. But I would be really happy to, uh, to collaborate with other people who are interested in the same work, maybe it's in a cons consultative uh, function, or maybe I could come back to the Philippines as a public buying scientist eventually and mentor students who are interested in the same project. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a very good plan. Uh, now we will open the floor to questions so that um, you will remember who the speakers are. Let me share this with you. They have the emails on the left-hand side. So if you have a particular question for a particular person that you don't want to ask now, you can email the speakers. Um, let me go back to Aimee, who had, uh, Dr. Del Mundo, who had a uh, comment on Renzo's presentation. Aimee, please. Yeah. You mentioned. Thank you, Ma. Yes. Yeah. Please. So, uh, hi, Renzo. Still there? Yeah, hi. Great talk, of course. So, for me, you know, with climate change and Philippines climate sensitivity, it, it, it's just a very, you know, uh, diffuse problem. And as I said in my comment, there's a lot that is out of our control. So do you think there are things that are within our control? And if you're, you know, just let's say that you are going to line up your docs, which one would be your top three, you know, factors or policies or steps that you would recommend that you know, Philippines or Filipinos should focus on so that, the, uh, you, you know, so that we would lessen our sensitivity to climate change. Does it make sense to you? Yep. Thank you, Aimee, for that question. No? Uh, very, very important. Uh, I think, um, and, and I, I hope I was able to highlight that in my presentation, you know, we now live in the age of adaptation. That's also another phrase that has been circulating around because as I've said a while ago, unfortunately, uh, climate action has been very slow um, in terms of redu reducing greenhouse gas emissions. We're still hopeful that we will not breach the uh, two degrees Celsius uh, global average temperature increase that the IPCC uh, prescribed as the limit. No? Uh, and that is what uh, the Paris Agreement is all about. The deadline is 2030. Beyond that, then we will be in uh, entering uh, or, or um, you know, going beyond a point of no return. And that's why, for example, the healthy climate letter that Dr. La Pena shared a while ago, that's actually a global call from the global health sector calling for deep emission cuts uh, in the next few years, you know, through uh, stopping of fossil fuel uh, development, uh, you know, uh, stopping deforestation, etc., so that we can still increase our chance of not um, going beyond the two degrees Celsius temperature increase. But while we're doing the global advocacy, and we need to be louder and and clearer in the advocacy, we need to start, unfortunately, thinking about building our own resilience to the inevitable health impacts, uh, but also the unknown health impacts. That's why in the presentation, I highlighted what are the knowns, you know, infectious diseases, uh, you know, air pollution, et cetera. We already know that, you know, and, and yes, we need to do more research, but that the, the links are pretty much uh, understood. But there are new areas like mental health, heat-related illness, um, and, and sea level rise that, are under-examined, you know, sea level rise, no research happening in the Philippines right now, especially in, the, in connection to health. Um, and that's a research that I want to start in the future. If you have access to funding, let's do it. Um, but, uh, and, and, and those are the areas where adaptation will be very much required. So we, we might have very little control on the emissions, although we still have to try find, to find ways to um, you know, shift to renewable energy. The country has so much potential for renewable energy and still we're relying on dirty fossil fuel. But I think the bigger control is in terms of how we're responding 
to the health impacts. I know it's a bit reactive, but I think as a you know as a country that is not a major player in climate emissions, that's the best thing that we can do. Uh, because obviously, U.S. and China are the countries that have to decarbonize dramatically um, if we want to not uh, breach the two degrees Celsius increase. I hope that was uh, uh, you know uh, satisfying, Amy. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Big question. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Would you con consider reforestation, for example? Would that be helpful? Sure. You know, it will yeah. increase uh, our, um, you know, carbon sink. So, Kanina, I was right. saying we need to cut our carbon sources, but we right. also need to increase our carbon sinks. You know, forests are important uh, in the sequestration of carbon from the atmosphere. Uh, and in fact, you're right. No, the Philippines has seen the, a very fast rate of deforestation over the past century. Right. Um, and the right. challenge now is how to reverse that. When now there's an obsession around, you know, uh, there's an infrastructure fetishism in the country. We want to build the new buildings and, the, and turn the natural ecosystems into casinos, golf courses, and tourist spots, right? So I think ultimately, it's a big question of development, right? And what is the development trajectory of the country? Do we want more concrete or do we want more forests that will be good for climate and health? That is Thank a difficult question. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ren. Ang hirap, Mama. <laughs> oh, Mayra. Those are very thought-provoking. Uh, we have uh, two raised hands, but before I call on you, uh, may, do we have any student, any student with one question? You're the youngest generation. You must have questions, please. Otherwise, I will call on the older generations. No questions from the young ones? Dr. Serafika, you raise your hand, please. Uh, thanks again, Yasmina. This one's really for Purello, uh, Dr. Galibo. Uh, thanks for expressing your desire to come back to the Philippines. Uh, again, you reminded me of my old field in digital engineering when I started my company in the US in 1996. Uh, so clearly to me, uh, that capability of us engineering tissues uh, in the Philippines has not become to fruition 25 years after. Uh, it was a hot activity in, in, uh, in the U.S. So uh, thank you for expressing that. And uh, of course, there's a, a body of work uh, with uh, one of our past number presentations last year on organ on a chip uh, with Dan Tagle. Yeah. And I don't know if you're familiar with that work. Uh, there is some activity now in the Philippines trying to do what we call a bioconvergence. This is the use of 3D printing to print cells and uh, program possible uh, organ on a chip. Uh, I, I would hope that uh, you'd be part of that moving forward. Uh, but definitely the, the work of uh, Dan Tagle has been an inspiration to me for the last five years in being able to create uh, capability of organs that we can test bioactive agents without having the actual organisms, living organisms to see the response. So how quickly do you think you can uh, channel your expertise to the needs of the local community in the Philippines if you were given a chance? <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot, uh, Dr. Galivo, but and also, when are you going to be available to come back to the Philippines? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to lock you in. <laughs> I can probably go um, go jump into a plane right now and go <laughs> and be a big scientist. But seriously, I don't, those um, organic chip as well as the um, 3D printing are really exciting aspects of cell therapy as well as um, devices. So I would really be really happy, given a chance, if I could go back and um, you know, um, uh, share my share my expertise in cell therapy and uh, and collaborate with other people in the Philippines. So, in terms of the timeline, um, actually, I've been in talk with some people in the Philippines. However, due to the pandemic, our plans were actually derailed. So, I'll probably be um, um, going back and regenerating that plan as soon as possible once the pandemic is over. So I could probably share my knowledge and go back and see, you know, all the exciting, happy, all the exciting stuff that people are doing in the Philippines, and maybe be part of those uh, exciting technology as well as research. Yeah, thank you. We have one question from Zypher. 
Hi. Hi. Uh, my question is for Dr. Renz Ginto. Hi, Sir Renz. You're still there? Yep. Okay, okay. Um. Uh, I, I came from the exposure assessment and epidemiology risk lab in National Institutes of Health, UP Manila. So my question is, is there some kind of systematic scoping of the environmental uh, problems that we have in the Philippines so that we could, you know, ha uh, have the, the knowledge in what, what research is to be done? For example, we have this... Uh, previous project on the acute uh, effects of air pollution in EDSA, particularly on the hyper uh, cardiovascular and pulmonary markers of uh, traffic enforcers. So we examined the air pollution, the temperature, and the relative humidity. So we examined the acute exposure. So, but, but these are just uh, just acute um, uh, hmm. acute uh, studies. And when we talked to DNR, they said that they have they don't have robust uh, robust uh, what they call measurement in terms of air pollution and their data might be like fluctuating from time to time, for example, for PM 2.5 or PM PM10. So is there some kind of like review of the existing problems in it? Air yep. pollution, mm -hmm. marine marine damages, and how how can you relate it to to the to health mm -hmm. to current uh, health systems in the country? Yep. Thank you so much, Zypher. That's a very important question. Um, and you know, the quick answer is, you know, we don't have a national climate and health research agenda that is very detailed and granular, right? So I want to make sure it, I'm clear because. If you look at NURA, climate change is mentioned, but we haven't listed yet what are the specific areas or knowledge gaps in the climate and health nexus. And, you know, I guess my next task is to turn this presentation into a paper so, so that we can submit it to, um, let's say, DOST. And of course, DOST, for instance, and DOH can lead a more um, inclusive and uh, systematic uh, process. And, and that's why you know, scholars and practitioners who are uh, operating in this new space uh, should be brought together by, by government uh, to develop this climate and health research agenda for the next 10 to 20 years. So, so that's my quick answer. In terms of the scoping, I showed to you one slide a while ago of a paper in 2019 did by colleagues, and they've only identified 39 papers. So that already shows to us a, a, um, a, a, a huge, uh, even dearth of climate and health research in the country. Perhaps there are some more, but they're not published. Uh, I think that's also something that we need to um, encourage ourselves, right, to do research and to publish as well. Um, and then, of course, um, you know, the, um, there are some, um, you know, the, the DOH has a National Environmental Health Action Plan. So that's not a research agenda. It's an action plan. And it identifies some of these problems like, again, I think for climate change, it, it, climate change and health is just mentioned as as a big component, but the granular you know, details are, are not. No? Uh, in fact, there's a paper that we will be publishing in The Lancet very soon on, the new, uh, on, a, uh, on a proposal for a climate and mental health research agenda for the Philippines. Um, and, so, and that's just for mental health alone, right? We've, I, I've identified some other knowledge gaps. So, so yeah, I think we need to just work together, collaborate. Uh, let's, let's connect, you know, for all the ones in the room or the Zoom who's interested in this exciting and, and emerging new space. I think we need to start listing down all the research questions and then ask the OST and DOH to fund them. Thanks. <laughs> I think um, it is very important to, you know, involve the big government agencies, particularly Indeed. the DOST and DOH, from right. uh, from the very start. Since right. uh, 2022, there will be new administration and the Correct. NURA will be modified again. Exactly. Based mm -hmm. on the priorities of the current administration. So maybe... Mm -hmm. It's really important to involve the big administrations, particularly the D big agencies, rather, particularly DOST, PCHRD, and the DOA. Correct. And Climate Change Commission. So the interesting yeah, thing is CCC Commission. is also involved in this. And DNR, yeah. as Amy mentioned. In, in, in the preparation and the development of uh, NURA 2022 for yep. the next administration. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting discussion. Uh, before I call on Dr. Tevis, 
Uh, Dr. La Pena has posted the link to the uh, Healthy Climate Letter if you want to sign it. So the link is in the chat box. So uh, we'll call on Dr. Tevez for his question, please. Franco, are you still there? There, thank you. Uh, yes, yes, I'm still here. Uh, thank you very much, Renzo. Uh, your, your post in the chat is very thought-provoking. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, really, um, climate re uh, climate related problems are very urgent. I think uh, all of us uh, agree. And so, my I have a proposal. I don't know if it's okay. If you could probably initiate um, a, a national meeting, for example, in the creation of a roadmap that uh, will really have you know outlined uh, specific actions that can be done, because there have been a lot of meetings already uh, being sponsored by different organizations. But still, these are only um, theoretical aspects and there, there is, seems to be no, no action yet. So uh, I'm thinking about, you know, uh, probably an, an offshoot of this, um, this meeting that we have uh, would be, you know, really developing a roadmap. Uh, we can focus on the Philippines. What, what can you say about it? Wow, it's giving me goosebumps. I think that's a brilliant idea. But I think the lowest hanging fruit is for PAASE with NAST, with NRCP to join forces, come up with a one page statement saying we are, you know, the Filipino scientists of the world from all disciplines and we want to tackle the climate emergency, not tomorrow, but today. Uh, thank you, everyone. <laughs> it, shows, uh, it shows your passion in uh, science and helping people you know, with their health. We have gone over time. Uh, if there are, are there any more questions? There are so many comments on the chat box. Uh, Kathleen, Kathleen, please. This is yeah. very important. Yes. Yeah, okay, yeah. I think there are really a lot of ongoing initiatives and, and you're correct, no? We really need just to to get together and collaborate. But the Future Earth Program, I know it's being spearheaded by our national scientists, um, Luli Cruz. So it might be something that can be included into their portfolio of strategies and actions that can be implemented. And Mam Luli, okay, who's, who's, oh yeah. And Mam Luli is also part of uh, PAASI, of course. Thank you. Once again, let me reiterate, if there are any young people here, please ask one question. Kathleen, do you know any young people in the audience? <laughs> let me oh. have a look. <laughs> yes, cold one. Please. I'll forever young. <laughs> a comment or a question is fine before we close, before we adjourn. Yeah, any of the, do we have fellows here, like the student fellows? I'm not sure, Katrina. We have any questions for our speakers? Katrina. Yeah, maybe they're still quite shy. <laughs> <laughs> a cipher Dao is young. He's still a student. <laughs> so, uh, we have gone through uh, five speakers from the molecule, from the DNA to biologics, to the production of penicillin, to the gallbladder, uh, working as a pancreas, and uh, to the social and behavioral sciences. We have gone through a lot in these two hours. Um, and I hope you come out of this uh, with uh, more ideas for solutions. You know, medicine is both preventive and curative. And if you can't do both, um, you can just uh, research until you find the avenue for this. Thank you everyone for your participation. Thank you to the speakers, to the organizers, to all of PAASE for you know, for gathering us in this wonderful and passionate discussion. Thank you all. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.
Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. I'm just